It is week three. The Cowboys are 2-0. and I'm Megan Robinson, and this is the Believe in OK State podcast. Thanks so much for listening today. And I'm super excited because I have my first ever guest, a beat writer for the Oklahoman, covers Oklahoma State University football, Jacob Unruh. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me, Megan. Yeah, so you have been following the team for a while, and I know that you were at the game on Saturday night. Pokes moved into the top 10 after their win over Arizona State. What were your overall thoughts on their game on Saturday? Uh, it was it was a good win. It was a good good way to keep the, the early momentum going. Um, you know, I thought the, the defense, I thought, played really well overall. And um, Spencer Sanders wasn't as sharp as he was the first week, but still played well. And, you know, the emergence, the emergence of – Dominic Richardson, I thought, was huge at running back. And that really puts OSU in a good spot moving forward. Um, he got big performances where he needed them. And, and it just felt like, it, you know, they needed a team to push them a little bit early, kind of figure out what they were made of a little bit. And uh, they got some of those answers. I want to dive into some of those people, players that you just talked about a little bit further. So the first one was Dominic Richardson. He had a career high of 27 carries for 131 yards and a touchdown. You know, last year, he only had three games where he had more than 10 carries. So he, you know, doubled his carries from games last season to now. And you also wrote an article that came out earlier this week about how running backs are being more used more in the passing game. Why do you think that they've included them in the passing game more this season? It's it's kind of a um, as Mike Gunny calls it, a trickle down effect. Um, a little bit. It's kind of just how the game has kind of evolved a little, and um, they need to get guys like that out in space because it's a mismatch over there. Because you usually put maybe a linebacker or a lineman over there to kind of ease, you know, to kind of try to take that away. And those guys, if you get the ball to them, they can make a miss and, and make big plays out of it. And um, Richardson's really um, improved his pass catching ability the last year or so um, he didn't do it a lot in high school I covered him in high school too so <clears throat> so I know you know what he was like in high school he didn't really catch a lot of passes didn't have to he pretty much ran through everybody or ran past everyone at, the, at high school and so um, they didn't have to throw the ball to him he could do it um, but you get him and Jay Nixon in space guys like that with the ball Ollie Gordon's shown some ability to catch the ball um, and it's changed things because passes are up you know, I think it's it's over five a game now and it was a little over three last year to running backs and so um, you're starting to see that a little bit more evolved. It's a good outlet for Spencer. Um, now that may change. Um, it's early, and it could be the defense side is going to start taking that away a little bit and and doing what they need to do to to limit that and making Spencer beat them downfield, and um, that could change. And, you know, as, as Mike Gundy said too, though, that's what Central Michigan used to really give their defense fits in that first game. Um, so that's kind of a reason you know, you've got to go with it because of all the mismatches it creates. And you see it a lot in the NFL game too. You know, I'm a Patriots fan. The Patriots are known for using their running backs for short, little quick catch plays. And you get, I mean, you don't need a big play. You just need to get 10, 10 yards and you have a first mm-hmm. down. So, and I read in your article too, that he, Dom Richardson has been catching 20 passes before practice. Yes. He's, he's taking it seriously, which I, I love. Uh, Spencer Sanders, he had a breakout game, I I think, against uh, Central Michigan week one, you know, career game for him. Um, you said he was a little, you know, not as big of a game, but he still had 322 yards of total mm-hmm. offense. And this is his third consecutive game with over 300 yards of total offense. So my thing going into the season was I needed to see consistency out of Spencer Sanders. And I think, you know, it's all, we're only two games in. You played Central Michigan and Arizona State, so we're not in Big 12 play yet. But I think he's been a little bit more consistent and a little bit more confident this season. What are your thoughts? Yeah, he just looks completely comfortable and in control the entire time, where it hasn't always been the case. Um, you started to see that last year. I felt like, you know, I know in people's minds, those Baylor, that Baylor Big 12 title game with all the interceptions really stick out to him. But when you look at the games before that, between the first time they played Baylor and the second time they played Baylor, he, he was incredible. He didn't turn the ball over, but maybe once a game, he barely, he, he barely, a lot of times had zero. And he might have had one multiple turnover game or something mixed in there, but he really carried that over in the Fiesta Bowl. He really turned it on. It carried over this season. You know, they talked about it a lot in the spring and, and, in the preseason camp that he just looked so much more in control. Gundy kept calling him a magician in the offense, which I thought was kind of silly until I saw him disappear from people running the ball last week. And I thought, okay, maybe he is making things kind of disappear here. Um, But he's just, when he's in command like that and he can throw the ball and he's making good decisions and he's in a rhythm, it's really hard to top what Spencer can do with this offense. 
And I was listening to the radio broadcast again, Central Michigan, mm-hmm. because I was driving and they were saying that he's actually one of the fastest guys on the Oklahoma State offense, mm-hmm. but, which I had no idea. You mean, you don't think about a quarterback being that explosive and that fast, but that, I mean, that really shocked me to hear that coming about Spencer Sanders. Yeah, he he can really run, and this year I feel like he's taken kind of a step forward in his running game already because he's already up to uh, I think three rushing touchdowns right now, which is he's on a ridiculous pace to to really kind of shatter his career highs in that. So I I think that watch lists and you know preseason things and all that come a little too early, a little too premature, but they exist anyway. If he continues on this trajectory, I mean to me he's on a watch list for the Heisman right now with the way he's playing. If he continues on this trajectory, do you think that we could possibly see him in New York come December? It's gonna take a lot. <clears throat> it's just really gonna take he's gonna have to keep it keep pace fleet of Central Michigan a little bit more. Um and oh she's gonna have to go undefeated. I think I think you know I think it's gonna take you know, you might get one loss in there. They, you know, but I just think that they're going to have to be in the play in, in the playoff hunt firmly, and no doubt about it. And he's going to have to be the big reason why to have a shot. But I just think that it, it it's going to be a tall task for him. And it's no offense to Spencer, but it's just kind of how it is. And you know, I think uh, he's got the ability to be one of the better quarterbacks in the country with the experience and talent he has, but it's going to take a lot to get him to New York. One last thought on the offense. One of the things I love about the offense this season is it's a lot of players are getting involved. He's thrown passes to 11 different receivers and week one, you saw uh, Br- Br- Braden Johnson, sorry, Braden Johnson mm-hmm. sort of had this breakout game after missing most of 2021. And this week it was, Rice and Green having a big game. You know, he had 83 receiving yards as a career best. So do you think that this this offense is going to, we're going to see sort of a spread, sort of balanced offense as a, when it comes to receivers? Or do you think one guy will sort of emerge as the star? In the past, it's always been that one guy. In the last year, it was Tate Martin. It was Tyron Wallace the years before that. James Washington. You know, guys like that, that, that really emerges as the star. And this year, I don't know that they particularly have that. I mean, Braden Johnson's in that position. He's playing that same position that naturally the ball tends to find that guy in that position. Um, you know, but he's he had a few drops last week, which is a little concerning. Um, but then you got guys with Brendan Presley and Bryson Green and John Paul Richardson's really emerged early. And you got guys coming off the bench like like a Langston Anderson and Guys like that that are really talented. Talon Shetron hasn't really played yet. A true freshman that's that's got all kinds of attention. And I just think he's going to spread the ball around. I think the ball is going to go around a little too much to have that one guy really take the charge that you think, okay, that guy's going to be the star. But I kind of love that because it's going to keep other teams yeah. guessing. Like you have to prepare for any receiver to have a big game mm-hmm. on any day. Yeah, and Spencer's advanced enough, too, that if you take away his number one option, he can usually find his number two, number three option. And so, you know, and that's the advantage of having a four-year starter that could be a fifth-year starter next year as he knows just about everything about this offense right now. On the other side of the ball, I think that my favorite stat of this game defensively Arizona State finished two for 13 on third town down for a 15.3% conversion rate, and they were went 0 for 9 to start the game. I just, like... Why do you think the defense had such a monster game when it came to third downs? <laughs> I actually asked Eric Mason about this after the game because they did this all last year under Jim Knowles. Uh, last year, they just – third down was – I think they were the best team, if not the second best team in the country on third down percentage last year. They It was remarkable. And I said just – I asked him if he noticed anything when he got here that said this team is really good on third down that he hadn't seen before. He kind of didn't, didn't give me – like a direct answer on it necessarily, but it's just the way they play. They just know they've got to get off the field. Um, I think they were frustrated. They weren't as as dominant on third down the week before against Michigan. I think they're a little frustrated with that, Um, but they've got the ability. They tackle, if they tackle well and stuff, they're they're really hard to get past, especially that front front group. But when you have that kind of pass rush, you give them a long situation like OSU tends to do on some teams. Lately with their defense, given a long yardage situation, that pass rush can really wreak havoc and cause a lot of third down miscues. Also, you know, I said in the very first episode this season that the defensive line that Oklahoma State has is just scary. And this week, Colin yeah. Oliver, Tyler Lacey, and Brock Martin all recorded a sack. So it's like if those three are going to be playing at that level, like I just feel like that defensive line is going to be nearly impossible to penetrate. 
Well, and you've got Trace Ford, too, who emerged, who looked like his old self this last week. Um, he nearly had a sack. He got the quarterback a few times, um, made some big plays, batted a pass down. You've got those four, not just those three. You have Trace Ford involved. Um, and they, they had him on the field together at the same time a few times because um, Tyler Lacey can move inside that defensive tackle position. You've got all four of those guys, your pass rushers there. It's it's scary. I, I don't like to, I don't I don't like to think what a quarterback's thinking when he looks across and sees those guys there because Brock Martin's one of the toughest players I've ever seen in my life, and Tyler Lacey has really emerged as a guy that I think is going to have a lot of NFL chances after this season. Colin Oliver is a star. Trace Ford, I I always thought was a first rounder until he's to t- t- until he tore two ACLs, and now you know if he can get back to that, I still think he could be a first rounder. And you've got just this immense talent right there just in that group. And that's not even including the defensive tackles that Brendan Evers is a fifth year, you know, as a super senior and uh, Sione Asi, I think just turned 26 years old yesterday. He's a veteran guy that's emerging and you've got Samuela Tule Lamaca who's emerging and you've got Colin Clay coming back from and not having to play because a few, a uh, few injuries the last couple seasons. And he's played Arkansas at SEC experience. You've just got so much talent and depth all across this line that, that I don't know a better line in the country. And Colin Oliver is only a sophomore. He is a true sophomore. So you have at least one more season of him, which, I mean, just blows my mind that he is that good, that talented, and like 19, 20 years old. Yeah. And if Trace hadn't got hurt last year, we may not have realized that. Yeah. So. So Oklahoma State, you know, sitting, I mean, it's too early to really read too much into uh, standings in the Big 12. We're only two games in, haven't gotten to conference play. But overall this week, it was a pretty crazy week around college football and in the big 12 um they announced the offensive and defensive player you know the players of the week for the big 12 i just want to touch on them a little bit you had texas tech qb donovan smith threw for 350 350 yards and combined for three touchdowns and a double ot victory over houston and kansas for the second week in a row kansas is the defensive player of the week defensive back Kobe Bryant. He had an 86 yard pick six in overtime to end mm-hmm. the game and secure the first ever Jayhawks win in Morgantown. What do you think of Kansas football right now? Because they are two and oh, <laughs> they are two and oh, it's a, it's a little strange. It's a strange world we're living in right now, but uh, you know, it's exciting for Kansas. Cause I just, I don't want to see him be the doormat uh, for the big 12. And um, it, it's exciting to see it. You know, it seems like they've got a really good offense going with Beal at quarterback and uh, there's a few Oakland, Oklahoma kids on that uh, running back position there that that have played well. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm totally blanking on their names right now, but uh, Deuce, Deuce is from uh, Moore, uh, and uh, and you've got uh, Savion Morrison who who uh, transferred in from Nebraska, had a touchdown the first week, and um, so you've got some guys there that that are really kind of emerged for them offensively. I think that's big. Um, I don't think they've allowed a sack in two games which is remarkable to me. And then, you know, the defense to do what it's done too is pretty impressive. And uh, I think Kobe Bryant in that award is kind of fun just because uh, you don't really ever see a 13 point overtime win in football. And so uh, to do that, I thought it was just kind of fun. So. And uh, Jalen Daniels, their quarterback had mm-hmm. 219 yards, three rushing touchdowns and 85 rushing yards. So he had over 300 yards of total mm-hmm. offense. People are kind of saying that Jalen Daniels might be, the real deal. So I'm in, I'm enjoying seeing Kansas do well to start the season, but they do have a big, uh, they have a, a, a big matchup this week um, that I think will kind of, they're hosting or Houston is hosting Kansas this week. So I think that mm-hmm. that'll be a really good test for them. And then I think the other game, you know, BYU beat Baylor in a sort of a big 12 future, big 12 preview and double overtime. Did you stay up to watch the end of that game or were you lame like me and fell asleep? <laughs> uh, we, we were working for the most of it. And then uh, I think we caught bits and pieces of it here and there. Um, I, I saw enough in the press box a little bit and I missed the overtime. Um, but as they're walking back to our car, but uh, you know, I just Baylor, I think is going to be really good. Um, I think BYU is really good too. Um I just, I, I don't know, and I didn't see enough to know what caused Baylor issues necessarily. It sounds like the receivers really kind of struggled, um, and Shaven couldn't get a lot going through the air, um, which is huge for them. And so, um, you know, if they get that figured out, they're going to be tough. That's who OSU plays in two weeks, and it's a Big 12 title rematch, and um, that's going to be pretty big. But uh, that was quite an epic finish. Um, and 
you know, that's exciting when you think about that's a future Big 12 game that you're going to have at 9 o'clock. And, uh, you know, you get that last hour for the Big 12, too, that last time slot. The last Big 12 game I need to talk about is the Bama Texas game. Did you happen to see any of that before the game? Because I, I was, it I was saw wild. Most of that. Sorry. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, it was, that was an incredible game. And um, a lot of things stood out to me. I mean, Texas, Texas defense looks like it's kind of the tex- old Texas defense. I don't know how much that's Gary Patterson being an analyst for him now, but um, they looked really fast and physical. Um, a lot different than they had the last few seasons. Um, and then I thought Quinn Ewers looked great until he got hurt, obviously. And, and Hudson Carr obviously played admirably and played well, uh, even as he battled through an injury. Um, it was big to go and compete like that with your backup quarterback, even hobbled himself, um, to hang with an Alabama like that. Um, they left a lot of time, obviously, and Alabama goes down and gets the field goal. But um, I thought there was a little bit of mix of some things. that I thought Texas looked really good. Um, but I also thought Alabama looked not so good, like in Alabama. They were very undisciplined um, and had some issues that I thought just uh, were not typical of Alabama. Yeah, Will Anderson, he had a lot of penalties that game, and he's, you know, probably going to be a top five. You know, people are saying he might be the first overall draft pick. He's sort of a leader on that defense, and I was sort of surprised. But going into that game, um, Steve Sarkeesian was like, this team, this game does not define the program. And I was very adamant, like, no, it absolutely does. And even though they lost, Texas is now ranked in the top 25. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it did define the program that they are tough. And like people ask every, is Texas back? And (laughs) I think the next few weeks will be sort of the judge of that. But I think that that might've been a push towards Texas being back. Yeah. I'm going to say maybe that's kind of (laughs) treading lightly. I mean, do do they fall off after this? I don't know. know. They they still got to play OU in Dallas and they've got to come to Stillwater. For our um, homecoming. Yeah, so it's, you know, I mean, those are tough road games. And so I just, you know, we'll see. I think that last week, though, with all the upsets in college football, I still personally can't get over the Marshall-Notre Dame upset. That's, I mean, yeah. I, I can't can't get over that one. But I think that that's kind of a good wake-up call entering this week against Arkansas Pine Bluff because you got to think, like, you can't take this team lightly because I'm sure that's what other teams did, you know, with App State mm-hmm. and a and Marshall and Notre Dame is like, oh, this is a, you know, FCS school. We don't care. But no, those are, you know, you can't mess around because that's when you fall apart. But Arkansas behind bluff is coming off a 76 to three victory last week. But this is the first ever meeting for these schools. So how are you feeling entering Saturday? Uh, I mean, I'm not that concerned for OSU. <laughs> uh, you know, Arkansas Pine Bluff struggle with the division two school in the first week. Um, that was an NAIA, NAIA school that's fairly new. I think only two or three years old in the program last week that they routed. Um, I just, you know, I, I don't I think OSU is extremely more talented and 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 prepared for this game than what uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff really can can do here. Um, it kind of reminds me. I hope I hope it doesn't get this bad, but you know they beat Savannah, LSU beat Savannah State eighty four nothing in 2012 and this kind of has a little eerie feeling like that too yeah i mean and uh again they've they've never played but um we've played a SWAC team once in 2009 and we won 56 to 6 and gundy's 13 and 0 when facing an fcs team so i i'm also confident and a win would improve osu's win streak breaking it setting a new record at 11. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I, I think also what's important to think about this week is this is the end of non-conference play. So this is, is, is this sort of a week for them to clean up any mistakes, try anything new in their playbook? Is this sort of a good game for that? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, you know, I think the, well, the goal is, I mean, the number one goal is come out healthy. Um, you know, you got the bye week, but, but I think that also is you get guys more opportunities, more reps, you know, I don't think. I don't. I wouldn't expect to see Spencer Sanders very long in this game if they if, if things go according to plan. Um, you're gonna get some of those starters out of there quick. I think some guys might hang around a little longer. Some of the offensive linemen, you know, some of the secondary guys like that that are a little inexperienced might get more reps. But the idea is to get guys that don't usually get a chance to get too many reps more reps here and uh, get prepared to where you know what you have going into to conference play. What kind of depth you have on some of these positions. You know, I think it's important to get Gunnar Gundy and Garrett Rangel both in there at quarterback. Um, get them throwing the ball, get them 
kind of loose getting used to it just because, you know, if Spencer does get banged up or whatever and has some miss some plays or some time, then then you've got you know what you have in the back and behind them because you know Gunner's played twice. He played last year against TCU and played in week one against Central Michigan, but he's yet attempt to attempt to pass. And so you've got to get him his feet wet. Um you've got to get Garrett Rangel's feet wet. And I think uh that's gonna be the goal here is kind of just broaden your your playing list and see you know who's who can do what you know when when gunner wasn't going in and against central michigan i was like why is spencer still in the game take him yeah. out and then he comes out and then central michigan makes her a bit of a comeback i'm like put spencer back in put him back yeah. in and they did they had to and that was <laughs> not what they wanted you know but it just was a bad fourth quarter and um you know the idea of, you know because they talked about the preseason the idea is they want to get up early in some of these non-conference games to get those quarterbacks some time and just hasn't, it hasn't worked out yet. For you, for you game notes, for those who are still wanting to go this weekend, tickets are still available for only $25 and it is family weekend. So there's a concert at the Botanical Garden on Friday night and there's Saturday, Saturday's pregame hall of fame block party and Sunday family weekend concludes with a women's soccer matchup against Brown university 1 PM. So I, you know, I feel like I don't even need to ask this, but who who are you taking this week? I think I'll take OSU. I think I'll. I th- it's a tough decision. So I do game picks with my dog every week. Picks okay. with Bix, and uh, he he went with the massive upset. Oh, he went with okay. Ar- Arkansas Pine Bluff, and I think it's because they're the Golden Lions, and he is just going for the animals. You know, yeah. it's yeah. he's supporting his his. Brethren, I guess, if you will. Maybe you should put a picture of bullet on there and see what happens. Maybe I should. I have Pistol Pete and I have <laughs> I, I have the mascots, and you know, I put I put the visiting team on the left, I put the home team on the right, and I put mm-hmm. the same treat on both. And he just lays there and he will pick. And you know, that's that's who he went with. And I messed up the recording, so it was actually a two out of three, and he went with Arkansas Pine Bluff twice. So, you oh, know, okay. he's he doubled down, went with it. All right. Uh, but before I let you go, I feel like we just have to recognize one of the Cowboys in the NFL. I'm sure you saw it. The Malcolm Rodriguez, Jason Kelsey, like body <laughs> slam. Yeah, it was pretty crazy, wasn't it? <laughs> I, like Jason Kelsey is a large man. He's just yes. a large man. And he's definitely I'm from Philly. So, you know, he's definitely one of the tougher Eagles that you hear about. And, what you know, yeah. he's he, and to see he's that he's a Hall of Famer, he's a yes. six-time All Pro, like yes. maybe he, the greatest center of all time. Yes, he is definitely not some pushover. I mean, well, he is if you're Malcolm Rodriguez, but he's not some pushover. <laughs> so I just feel like I had to give a shout out to Malcolm Rodriguez yeah. and the play seen around the country this weekend. And I hope we see more of it. His jerseys, I actually they're like sold out everywhere, mm-hmm. which is awesome. Yeah, it's 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 pretty crazy um, for a kid that's come from Wagner and came in as a safety with just one scholarship, you know, one other scholarship offer to Wyoming, and um, moved to linebacker and become became a star. And um, he's a very quiet star; he doesn't say much, um, but he'll throw you around on the football field. As people have known, he's hip tossed a lot of people, not just Jason Kelsey, but Jason Kelsey's the biggest guy. He's you know biggest name. He's he's hip tossed, and uh, you know he played well. Um, it's really exciting. He and Jalen Warren both. You know, Jalen Warren was tossing around guys at running back too, was blocking the other day. So um big big time NFL day for for a couple OSU guys, but Malcolm, it was man, that was fun to see. It was just it was a lot of fun to see. It's great to see the hard work pay off and them all do well. And I it's it just and and any of them, you just want to see any of former cowboy have uh, have a great game. So hopefully we see more from Malcolm, more from some of the other guys in the NFL throughout the season. But Jacob. Thank you so much for taking some time to breaking down last week's game, this week's game. Loved hearing your perspective and getting someone who's, you know, sort of in it to, to give me their thoughts and what they, they hear around the practice facility. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And I appreciate you all listening to this episode of Believe in OK State. New episodes Thursday. I will catch you guys next time. And of course, go Pokes. 